Your eminent, reverent fathers, my lords, ladies, gentlemen, saints and scholars. At the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change International Law Drafting Unit, they do not call a spade a spade, because they don't do simple. They call it a one-person operated, manually controlled, foot-powered implement of simple and robust yet adequately efficacious lignometallic composition, designated primarily, though by no means exclusively, for utilization on the part of hourly paid operatives deployed in the agricultural, horticultural, or constructional trades or industries, as the case may be, for purposes of carrying out such excavational tasks or duties as may, from time to time, be designated by supervisory grades as being necessary, desirable, expedient, apposite, or germane, with regard to the ongoing furtherance of the task or objective in hand, or on the other hand, underfoot, Secretary General. <laughs> you will be relieved to know that unlike most of the bureaucratic and governing classes, this particular peer of the realm will be speaking in plain English today. <laughs> Now, I have to make an admission. Global warming is real. And if you see the slide there, I am most grateful to Professor M. I. Bhatt of the Indian Geological Survey, who kindly communicated to me this interesting result in climatological thermodynamics. And deforestation can be a problem. I don't know whether you can see that slide, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, now, what I'm going to do is be nice to climatologists, because climatologists are creatures whose knuckles drag along the floor. And so we have to be gentle with them and pat them on the head. And we're going to start out by agreeing with them on quite a lot of things. We're going to agree that, yes, there are greenhouse gases, and therefore, yes, there is a greenhouse effect. It does exist. Yes, our sins of emission enhance it. In my day, I must say, sins of emission had a different connotation, but there it is. And then some warming of the climate has resulted, and some more warming will result. And you may think, well, uh, you know, what else is there if you agree with them on all of that? But let me ask you this question. Hands up, all those of you who think that global warming caused by uh, us is or ever could be a, a dangerous or cat catastrophic problem. Hands up. Oh, good. That's the end of my talk. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> well, now I'm going to say what, where we disagree and what this lecture is about. And the first point... And you may think this is rather harsh and unchristian, but unfortunately it's true. And after that outstanding presentation by Monsignor Schmidt on truth, I think I'd better adhere to the truth, however unpalatable it may sometimes be. Environmentalism in its extreme forms is genocide, and I am going to demonstrate to you exactly how this genocide occurs and how many people are losing their lives as a result of global warming policies. Not of global warming, but of the policies piously intended may be to do away with it. I'm also going to echo Monsignor Schmidt in pointing out that science without religion tends to fail because it does not have a moral obligation to try to find the objective truth. And the Monsignor was quite right in saying that objective truth, truth that is true whether you or I or anyone would like it to be true, that is the truth to which science just as much as theology ought to adhere. So we're also going to look at the environmental as well as economic costs of extremist environmentalism as it relates to global warming. We will be looking at the illogicalities, which are quite hilarious, in the fanatics case. And we'll also be ending by exposing the extraordinarily elementary and very large and significant error of physics which has led directly to the climate scam. Were it not for this error, which I think was originally inadvertent, 
there would be no concern about the climate and by the end of this talk you will realize there is no need for concern about the climate but then you've realized that already so we begin then with environmentalism the cult of decide now ddt whose inventor won a nobel prize because he had saved more lives than anyone else in the history of humankind ddt used to eradicate malaria then the environmental left as one of their earliest actions had it banned as a result the deaths from DDT, which had been one or two million a year, had gone down to 50,000 a year because of DDT. They then went back up to one or two million a year, or 450,000 a year, if you're the World Health Organization. So this was a, a, cat, a catastrophe, and that was one of the first actions of international hard-left environmentalism. Now we bring it on to the climate, where in homes without mains electricity, there are 4.3 million deaths a year from particulate pollution in open cooking fires. And this is just one of many categories of deaths in the millions or tens of millions that arise directly from the fact that a lot of people don't have electricity. More than 500,000 women a year die in childbirth, chiefly owing to act lack of access to electricity. 1.3 billion people have no access to electrical power, even though access is defined as having one light bulb running for just four hours a day. Life expectancy in Africa, where they have virtually no electricity south of the Sahara, is 60 years compared with 80 years in the West. And that shows just how many tens of millions every year are dying because they don't have the electricity that we could give them if it wasn't banned by the global warming policies. The mean IQ in sub-Saharan Africa, where there's not much electricity, is 70, which in the West would be regarded as severely incapacitating and mentally subnormal. Among black Africans in America, it's 85, and the U.S. military will not allow anyone to serve in the military with an IQ of less than 85, because you can't even get them to clean a latrine properly if their IQ is that low. And these problems stem very largely from lack of electrical power in Africa. So we have to give them that power, but the international community, so-called, is determined not to because the environmental left have persuaded it that to do so would be to put the whole planet at risk. Here is what Africa looks like at night, and I flipped the photograph so you've got two images, one in each direction, but you can see that Europe at the top is ablaze with light, Africa not very much light there, south of the Mediterranean littoral and until you get down to South Africa itself. It's practically unlit at night. How can an undeveloped nation develop if its children cannot study their books when the sun goes down at six in the evening. The World Bank stopped lending for coal-fired power stations in 2010 and has now announced that it won't lend for oil and gas extraction after 2019. Its sole excuse for this monstrous policy, depriving those Africans of the electricity they so urgently need, is global warming. So they'd better be right hadn't they? Because just look at the number of deaths that we're getting. And even the UN, which is schizophrenic on this issue, here is here Jean Ziegler, who was in 2007 the right to food rapporteur of the UN, saying that growing food and then using it for biofuels is a crime against humanity. And here is just how much the yellow there is the ethanol, which is made from palm oil and other such sources and, and, and maize that's grown that would originally have fed people and is now feeding motor cars and gumming up their engines. So who then will speak for the hungry in Africa? 
who need above all else electricity so that they can study, so that they can have their operations healthily, so they can be born healthily, so that they can have a pumped water supply. These are, electricity is essential to all these things. And solely because of global warming policy, they are being denied it. And approximately 10 to 20 million people a year die worldwide because they do not have electricity. And because of global warming policies, an increasing fraction of that 10 to 20 million every year die because of global warming policy. So I say again, they'd better be right about global warming if they can justify two or three holocausts a year of admittedly black people somewhere else so they don't really matter. Well, that is not how the church ought to view this question. We do not regard black people as inferior. They are human beings just like us. They reflect the divine in their souls just like us. And they, at the moment, are flocking to Christianity just like we used to do, but will not do again until Monsignor Schmidt's call to reform is thoroughly heeded. And is Holy Mother Church, in the person of the Pope, speaking out for those who do not have electricity in Africa? Nope. He has joined the ranks of the environmental extremists. Now let us look briefly at the environmental cost of environmentalism. Here is a typical windmill. It's a big one, but they all are these days. This is a 7 megawatt windmill, and the length of the typical blade of one of those is 88 and a half of your meters. We use yards in the UK, but you have meters. 88 and a half meters. And it revolves at about 20 revolutions a minute. It's quite slow. You see it just going round like this once every three seconds. And a, but a bird, seeing that, will think, oh, that's quite slow, I can cope with it. But the tip of that blade, it's a simple enough sum, will be travelling at 666 kilometres an hour, the number of the beast. So birds and bats are being batted out of the sky by these bird-blending monstrosities, and this is what that looks like. And does the environmental campaigning group care about any of this? Has Pope Francis, who says he speaks up for the animals and the birds, has he spoken out about this? Nope. There has been an unbecoming and disfiguring silence. And these windmills, they kill birds and bats. They're unnecessary because you can generate the electricity far more cleanly and with less CO2 emissions if you simply use coal-fired power stations, which otherwise have to remain inefficiently on spinning reserves standby in case the wind is either blowing too much or not enough, which it does approximately four-fifths of the time. And so the, the, we're actually emitting more CO2. Every time you see a windmill, that is going to emit more CO2 as the total part of the system than if you just had a coal-fired power station. And at the same time, it's trashing the landscape and killing the birds. It's not very sensible. The other thing, if you try to suppress the growth of CO2, is you're suppressing the greatest of all natural fertilizers. Because CO2 fertilizes plants. They breathe CO2 in through the stomata on the undersides of their leaves. And using water and sunlight together with the CO2, they photosynthesize. That's how they grow. And because of the extra CO2 in the atmosphere, the total green plant and tree biomass of the Earth, known as its net primary productivity, has increased by between 15 and 30 percent just in the last few decades alone. And I bet all you've heard from the newspapers is all the forests are being burnt and uh, we're cutting down the forests and all the green material is, is going, but it's being more than replaced thanks to extra CO2 that we have released into the atmosphere. CO2 is plant food and therefore it's food both for animals and for humans too. And indeed, here, my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Craig Idso, has listed the increases you would get in the crops of various staple food crops. So it's difficult to read this slide, but all you can see is that just about every food crop is improved if you double the CO2 in the atmosphere. Likewise, the environmentalists don't seem to care that if you keep people cold, then you kill them. So warmer weather 
is actually better for life on Earth. And all this stuff about how if the temperature rises another half degree, then the entire world's going to come to an end, which you hear from the UN at the moment. It is total nonsense. And in fact, the EU Commission, which as you know is not exactly backward in backing this environmental nonsense about global warming, did a survey to try to prove how many lives would be lost if temperatures increased this century by up to 5.4 Celsius degrees. Don't worry, they're not going to, as I shall explain later. But if they did, and they estimated that the warmer it got, the more lives in net terms you would save, because it's cold that's a much bigger killer, not only of humans but of other animals, than heat is. And so to the shock of the European Commission, they found that their own research into this showed that the more you allowed the planet to warm, the more lives you would save. And did they change their policy when confronted with this fact from their own research? Well, no, of course not, because this has nothing to do with the environment and everything to do with the destruction of capitalism. And here are the actual figures of the, the, the various increases in deaths from heat and the decreases in deaths from cold. And you can see the decreases in deaths vastly exceed the increases in deaths for each quantity of warming that we might get. And what about the cuddly polar bears? Well, the first thing is they're not cuddly. And uh, if you meet one on a dark night, you really don't want to. And secondly, there were about five to 15,000 of them in the 1940s. That was a reasonably reliable estimate. There are now about 30,000. They found 3,000 more in the Chukchi Sea just last week. And they said, oh, we've never been able to count these before. And there are 3,000 of them. <laughs> so the polar bears are not exactly threatened with extinction. All of that is nonsense. But science without religion becomes mere superstition. And a superstition is unlike a religion. You see, a religion is something which cannot be proven to be true or false. It's just a matter of belief. A superstition is a pattern of belief which can be proven to be false and is yet adhered to. And the scientists who are backing the global warming nonsense are effectively being superstitious. The characteristic of a superstition is it ignores the truth of which Monsignor Schmidt spoke so movingly. And in this presentation we are going to look at the importance of truth. And you see in St. John, the truth shall set you free, there it is in several languages. And what was the manifesto of the Lord of life? God the Father, after all, was, was described in the Old Testament as the God of truth. God the Son, uh, dwelt among us, uh, full of grace and truth, is the way, the truth, and the life, and sent us, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And what is Satan on the other side of the account? The Father of lies. And here is the manifesto of the Lord of Life. This is a picture by Duccio di Buoninsegna from the 13th century. You'll see a tr the transition here from the rather rigidity of the Byzantine art into the more flowing art of the uh, Renaissance, and even a, a, a rather clumsy attempt at perspective for perhaps the first time in the history of painting. And in this a portrayal, which is one of many portrayals, of course, of the most celebrated show trial in history. Pilate is actually looking interested in what the Lord of Life is saying. And what is the Lord of Life saying? He is saying, to this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. And if that manifesto is good enough for the Lord of Life, then it's good enough for you and me. And it's good enough for scientists, except that if they don't have religion, they may not necessarily feel the obligation to do what every true scientist should do and try to find the objective truth. Here is Rembrandt's uh, painting of the same thing, or a sketch of the same thing, and you'll see Pilate here dressed in the native Jewish costume, talking to the Jews and the Lord of Life unconsidered in the background. And then a really very telling image uh, from the 20th century by Mihai Munkachi, where Pilate is visibly bored and twiddling his thumbs and washing his hands. And that's the problem we face in trying to convince the global establishment that they should not simply fall prey to the screeches of the environmental extremists. And they should instead take a rational approach and try to find what is the objective truth. And as the search for the objective truth is not just a characteristic that's unique to Christianity. Islam has it too. 
And just as Thales of Miletus had founded the scientific method in the West, so Abu Ali ibn al-Hasan ibn al-Husayn ibn al-Husayn ibn al-Haysam, <laughs> who was as proud of his ancestry and his lineage as am I, he said this, he, say, he described the scientist as the seeker after truth. And he said the seeker after truth is one who doesn't submit to any mere consensus, however ancient or venerable or widespread. Instead, he subjects it to argument and demonstration and not to what somebody's told him or what some campaigner has told him. So that was, we are at one with the Muslims in saying that you have to look for objective truth when you're doing science. But do you think that some of the scientists who are doing this global warming stuff are looking for objective truth? Well, not really. And even the atheists, such as T.H. Huxley, who debated Bishop Sophie Sam Wilberforce in 1860 on the question of evolution and beat him, he says this, the man of science has learned to believe in justification not by faith, but by verification. And the word verification comes from the Latin veritas, which means truth. So this importance of truth could not be more crucial. In fact, the central principle of logic, which is very seldom stated in the textbooks, but is nevertheless the underpinning of all mathematics, all physics, all the sciences, is as it is stated there, every proposition that is true is consistent with all other propositions that are true and inconsistent with every proposition that is false. And so what I'm going to do to you today is just give you the objective truth as best I and my team of distinguished professors and doctors of science, well, there are a dozen of us and we work for nothing, so all contributions gratefully received, um, we, we are genuinely trying to find the truth. I'm not going to try to shoot you a party political line, unlike the environmental campaigners. This was, I was actually at this event, it was a demonstration outside the Copenhagen Climate Conference conference in 2009 and for the first time as far as I can discover since the Berlin Wall came down the hated hammer and sickle symbol of the communist tyranny that murdered something like a quarter of a billion people in the 20th century was openly flown in the streets at a climate conference do you begin to see the connection? And here is one of the leading lights in the IPCC saying that climate change policy is about how we redistribute de facto the world's wealth. And he's not talking about a free market distribution. He's talking about a communist distribution organized by the likes of him. And you may think, oh, that's going a bit far, calling this attitude communist. So let's be more explicit. Here is uh, Ms. Christiana Figurehead, who was in charge of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change recently. And in 2016, she said this, democracy is a poor system for dealing with global warming. Communist China is the best model. And here you see always the father of lies in the end finds himself from time to time having to reveal his hand. He tips his hand and he shows us what he's up to so that we can wake up and do something about it. And here we are being told that what this is all about is nothing to do with the environment. As Edenhofer said, it's everything to do with the advancement of communism. And is communist China really the best model? No. Uh, a fellow communist, Mr. Obama, went to China before the Paris Agreement and said, look, please don't trash this one as you trashed the Copenhagen Agreement. We're all communists together. This is going to bring down the West. For heaven's sake, agree to it. And the Chinese said, well, as long as we don't have to cut our CO2 emissions, as long as we don't get any international inspections, we don't mind what the rest of you do. So we'll sign up to it. And that's what happened. So China now emits one third of all the world's emissions, despite having only one sixth of its population. And that is the model that we're being told to follow by Ms. Figurehead. You can see how entirely political this has become. Now we're going to look very briefly at the economics of whether it's worth doing anything about making global warming go away. We don't, after all, want to end up like Zimbabwe, where this hundred trillion dollar note wouldn't even buy you a, a, a loaf of bread. And why not? Because Zimbabwe became a communist country under Mugabe, just as South Africa became a communist country under Mandela, and in both places the economy was trashed as a result. So we're going to explain how an economist will look 
at whether you should invest today to avoid some sort of imagined disaster tomorrow and to benefit our grandchildren by not sort of ending the planet. And you use to, to work, there's, there's, a, there's a fundamental principle here, which is that um, the bird in the hand rule is that a dollar today is worth more to us in our pockets than it is to us if it's in the sticky pockets of our sticky grandchildren a hundred years hence. That's the principle. And so you have a discount rate, an annual compound discount rate, which reflects the fact that that money is worth less to us than, our own, than if it's in our own pockets today. And the usual discount rate is 7%. That's what a commercial company would use in deciding whether to make a long-term forward investment. But because the Stern report in Britain, which was the first official socialist governmental report to look at this in 2006, decided that there was a 10% possibility that the world would come to an end by 2100 by, as a result of global warming, for which there is absolutely no scientific basis. He said, we're therefore going to take a utility discount rate of 0.1%, uh, to which we add the 1.3% uh, average consumption growth to get a final discount rate of 1.4%, which is only one-fifth of the, of the average discount rate that a commercial entity would use. And the justification, of course, is we have to save the planet. Well, here's the answer. We are Catholics, and we can tell them a thing or two about saving the planet. The planet was triumphantly saved 2,000 years ago, and it doesn't need to be saved again. <laughs> So the market discount rate, as I've said, is 7%. The absolute minimum would be 5%, but we're going to use 7 And then you may think, oh, but what about all those future generations? We do not benefit them if we waste their inheritance by justifying spending on silly projects like global warming uh, because we simply deprive them of some share of what we would otherwise be able to leave them. It doesn't help future generations if we use artificially low discount rates. In fact, as Professor Václav uh, Klaus, who was the president of the Czech Republic at the time, said at a conference I organized in Cambridge a few years ago, undermining the current economic development by using artificially low discount rates harms future generations as well as harming our own. So what we want to do is to convert the 3% of total 21st century global GDP that the Stern report said would be his best estimate of the cost of doing nothing about global warming. Uh, but he did that on the basis of a 1.4% discount rate. So we're going to use a 7% discount rate. And there is a simple little equation, which you see here, which converts the one to the other. And you'll see that the 3% cost, he said, would apply if we didn't do anything about global warming. It comes down by nine-tenths to just 0.3% of GDP. That's the cost of doing nothing, even if you believe, as Stern did, there was going to be three Celsius of global warming in the 21st century, which there isn't. So let's look at a case study to see just how silly all the governments that are spending money on global warming are being. And first of all, we're going to make a few simplifying assumptions, the most important of which is that we're going to accept that official climatology is correct, but just for the sake of argument. And we're going to make a, a case study. We're going to look at Australia's carbon tax. And the carbon tax was proposed by the socialist government, first of Kevin Rudd and then of Julian, uh, Julia Gillard in 2009 to 2010. And over the 10 years to 2020, they were proposing that 5% of Australia's emissions would be abated by a carbon tax. But Australia's emissions only account for 1.2% of world emissions, so the carbon tax was going to reduce world emissions over those 10 years only by 0.06% at a cost of $130 billion. So you can see where this calculation is going to go. This is how silly it is. Nobody until I sat down and did these numbers had ever actually sat and worked it out. And here is how much global warming would be made to go away if the Australian carbon tax had been implemented in Australia over those 10 years at that cost of $130 billion. Now, if you go into a sweetie shop and you say, I'd like to buy some sweets and I've got a euro or some other collapsing currency, um, <laughs> then... You know, you would expect the owner of the sweetie shop to tell you how many sweets you can get for your bit of collapsing currency. 
But the governments are spending money on making global warming go away without telling them how much warming that these policies are going to make to go away. Because the simple equation you see at the top of the screen there, I had to invent that equation because there is nothing similar to it anywhere in the economic literature. After the most rigorous peer review, this equation was published in the annual journal on planetary emergencies of the World Federation of Scientists five years ago. But to this day, nobody else has ever actually used it. And the reason why they haven't is that if you do use it, you can see just how entirely silly it is to spend any money on making global warming go away. And I'm going to explain why it's obviously so silly, because looking at that equation, you might not immediately see what's going on. So the point is this, that you're only going to forestall, forestall 0 0.00008 Kelvin or Celsius of global warming with the Australian policy over 10 years at that cost of 130 billion. And there would have been 412 parts per million of CO2, that was the projected level by 2020, if Australia had done nothing. But we have to admit that that 130 billion would reduce the amount of CO2 that would be in the atmosphere in 2020. It would no longer be 412 parts per million, it would be 411.987. <laughs> and nobody had sat, this da had sat down and actually worked this out. So I took these calculations to Tony Abbott when he was Prime Minister and he junked the whole plan. So then we have uh, we can do uh, some sums to work out what would happen if we wanted to use policies equivalent to Australia's, which are fairly typical in their cost and their ineffectiveness. Uh, they are about average, which is why it's a good example to take. I have done dozens more and they all show similar results. What if we wanted to use these policies worldwide to stop one Celsius of global warming that might otherwise happen? That would cost a modest 1.6 quadrillion dollars per Celsius abated. Now you might want to have that broken down into slightly smaller figures. It works out, if you wanted to abate just the one-sixth of a Kelvin of warming that should have happened over uh, 2011 to 2020, um, if we hadn't done anything about it, then the cost would have been 318 trillion in cash, or 48 and a half thousand dollars per head of global population, or about two-thirds of everything that the world makes and produces and sells throughout the entire 10-year period. That is how monstrously silly the economic cost of this is. And then we can work out, since it's going to cost about two-thirds of GDP, and we know that if we did nothing it would only cost 0.3% of GDP, we've just worked that out earlier, it's 200 times more expensive to make global warming go away by policies like Australia's, which as I've said are typical, than to just let the warming happen and adapt to it. Now would you if invited to make an investment that was 200 times costlier than just doing nothing, sitting back and enjoy the sunshine, I think you might be rather chary of handing over your hard-earned uh, bankrupt euros. <laughs> so the economic conclusions are very straightforward from this. Uh, the first of them, which is not at all unimportant, is that if, as the IPCC tries to pretend, the residence time of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is greater than 125 years, it isn't actually, but that's what they pretend, if they were right about that, then whatever we do in this century to mitigate global warming is not going to reduce the CO2 concentration. It's not going to make any difference within this century. And if you've therefore got 100 years of discounting at 7% compound, you can see it's not worth doing anything just on that fact about global warming. And you see how silly this all becomes the moment you simply try to look at the truth rather than taking a party line on one side or another. No policy to abate global warming by taxing, trading, regulating, reducing or replacing greenhouse gas emissions will prove cost effective solely on grounds of the welfare benefit of climate mitigation. CO2 mitigation strategies that are inexpensive enough to be affordable will be ineffective. Strategies costly enough to be effective will be unaffordable. Focused adaptation, if necessary, is better. And now, because you've seen how that example works mathematically, you understand exactly why. And we'll test you on this later. <laughs> now, the cost of the premium, the insurance premium against global warming, so greatly exceeds the cost of the risk insured 
that a sensible person would not in those circumstances take out insurance. I mean, if you go along and say, oh, hello, I'd like to insure me house, and they say, how much is your house worth? And you say, well, half a million euros. Oh, so it's worth nothing then. Um, <laughs> so then and if they said to you, well, in that case, your premium each year will be one million euros, would you say, oh, yes, to save the planet, I'll pay the one million euros? Of course you wouldn't. And you see how insane all this is. But now let's turn from the economics, where there is absolutely no case for doing anything, and now you can see why, to the science, so-called, of global warming. Now here you'll see a dozen propositions, which are the most common arguments that you hear from the enviro-communists about why we have to do something about global warming, why we have to close down capitalism for the sake of saving the planet. Now there is an interesting common theme that underlies all of these assertions. And I'm not going to read all of them to you, nor am I going to invite you to spot what that theme is, because unless you have specially trained, you wouldn't know what had been done. All of these propositions are logical fallacies, and their logical fallacies of the oldest kind of fallacy is an argument in which the uh, proposition or propositions which are the starting point do not validly entail the proposition which is the conclusion. And that is not a valid argument. All of these are conclusions which are not conclusions of valid arguments. They are logical fallacies. And the only thing you can logically deduce and rationally deduce from a logical fallacy is that those who perpetrate it are either knaves or fools or both. And let's now look very quickly at some of these fallacies. The biggest of the lot is, there's a consensus. And it's always said like that, there's a consensus. Now, the fact is that there isn't a consensus because my team did a paper a few years ago in the Journal of Education and Science which reviewed uh, 11,944 papers, we're a diligent lot, you know, uh, 11,944 papers published over the 21 years 1991 to 2011 in the learned journals after peer review to do with climate and related matters. And the original report about this particular selection of papers said that there was a 97.1% consensus that global warming is catastrophic. And actually, when we read these papers, we found that, and we looked at the list that had been compiled by the original authors of this supposed 97% consensus, we found that their own list of these papers had marked only 64 papers, which is 0.5%, as saying that global warming of the last 50 or 60 years was caused by us, which is the official definition of the consensus proposition. That proposition does it doesn't even say that global warming is dangerous or ought to be stopped. It just says that maybe most of it was done by us. And yet even then, they could only find 64 papers out of 11,944 that even went that far. So they rounded it up to 97.1% consensus. <laughs> so there isn't a consensus. And even if there were... Argument from consensus is the headcount fallacy, the argument about populum, as the medieval schoolmen called it. It is not a basis for rational decision. Ah, oh, but it's a consensus of experts. Yup, X, an unknown quantity, spurt, a drip under pressure. <laughs> Just because we're told that experts believe something doesn't mean the experts are right, doesn't mean they're honest, they may have just made a mistake, or they may wanted to continue profiting by some scam like global warming that they've dreamt up. So just because it's supposed to be a consensus of experts tells you nothing about the proposition to which that consensus is said to adhere is true. It doesn't even tell you whether those experts do adhere to that proposition. Then they say, we can't explain warming without CO2. Well, that's the argument from ignorance. It's a fundamental uh, fallacy of logic. First pointed out, all of these were first pointed out by Socrates in his dialogues with the sophists. They were reported by Plato. They were studied by Aristotle, who wrote about them in his book, The Refutations of the Sophists, 2,500 years ago. But those knuckle-dragging climatologists, they can't actually read ancient Greek, so they've not caught up with it yet. So then we have, warming is speeding up, so we must have caused it. That's the red herring fallacy. Just because the warming is speeding up, which actually it isn't, um, there's no basis for saying that therefore it must have been us. 
Then they say that cuddly polar bears are threatened. Well, you now know they're not. And so that's the fallacy of inappropriate pity. Pity can be inappropriate if the person or thing you're pitying doesn't need to be pitied. And the polar bears are doing fine, just thanks. And they'll have you for lunch if you get anywhere near them. <laughs> So then we emit CO2, so we must have caused the observed warming. No, that doesn't follow either. It's a very old fallacy called the fallacy of false cause, the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. Then we tell models the CO2 is to blame for everything, and they tell us the same. Well, that's the argumentum ad petitionem principi, the circular argument. It's another well-known fallacy. Then they say, hurricanes are bad. They must be our fault. But the hurricane of 1815, which was far worse than anything that's ever happened since, happened before there was a single SUV or coal-fired power station anywhere. So this is not new, and you cannot ascribe these supposed natural disasters to us. And indeed, the loss of life from weather-related disasters has fallen consistently over the last 50 years. Then they say, we cause warming, which is why Arctic ice is melting. This is the fallacy of converse accident. The previous one was the fallacy of accident. This is the fallacy of converse accident. The argumentum ad dicto simpliciter ad dictum secundum quid. The inappropriate argument from the general to the particular. And that doesn't follow either. Then they say, skeptics are all paid by fossil fuel interests. Are there any fossil fuel interests here? Because I haven't had my check this month. (laughs) So that, that's, the, that's the attack on the man and not his argument. I get it all the time. We're just paid by, by the fossil fuel companies. Well, alas, no, I'm not. Otherwise, I should be living on a diamond-encrusted yacht off moored off Monte Carlo rather than in the traditional thatched retirement cottage with roses round the door and a silver-haired wife standing there to greet me. <laughs> Come to think of it... I think I'm happier in the cottage than I would be on the yacht. So those are are just some of the fallacies, and I thought that these are just about all the fallacies that are mentioned uh, by Aristotle in his book, The Refutations of the Sophists, from which he went on to write two further books on logic, which were the prior and posterior analytics, from which the entire art and science of logic sprang complete from the head of um, Aristotle as uh, Athena fully armed from the head of Zeus. It was an extraordinary intellectual achievement. And logic has not much changed since his time. It is still the most reliable way of finding the truth. So now we end by looking at this enormous error of physics that I promised you uh, that they made, without which there would never have been a global warming scare in the first place. And what they did, these climatologists, is they forgot that the sun was shining. Now, the reason why is if you're a knuckle-dragging climatologist, you can't look up very easily, so you can't see it. Either that, or they're all Scottish and Irish, and you don't see that yellow thing in the sky anyway. (laughs) So what we're going to do, uh, yet again, is accept all of official climatology except what we can disprove. Because the way a Socratic elenchus works, this is the formal use of logic to determine the truth of a contested argument. You start by agreeing with everything you can about the other side's argument. So we're going to agree with everything that we can't prove to be wrong. Even though we can hold our nose and think a lot of it's just made up, we're going to take all of it except we can prove to be wrong. It turns out that after years of research, we can boil it down that you don't need a computer model, you just need these ten quantities, and using them you can derive exactly, uh, to within a very great precision, how much global warming we're likely to get. And if you think those quantities are uh, sceptical quantities, no, they're all from mainstream sources that are listed on the left there. Those are the quantities, and on the left there are the sources. Now, what we're going to do is look at the nature of the error that they made. Now, they say that only one Celsius of warming comes from a doubling of CO2 directly. But another two and a half Celsius comes from things called temperature feedbacks, which are knock-on effects because you warm the atmosphere. They say it'll multiply up and warm still more. And it's these feedbacks that they've got wrong. At the moment, they imagine... we try and get the right slide. Here we are. Oh, we're going backwards. Just like them. Um... Yeah, they imagine that feedback response constitutes 67% on average and up to 
900% of the predicted global warming. That nearly all of it comes from feedbacks. And 90% of the uncertainty about how much warming we're going to get. They say it's somewhere between 1.5 and 4.7 Celsius per doubling of CO2. And they tell us the science is settled with that huge range of uncertainty. They don't know what the heck is the amount of warming. Here you can see that the reference sensitivity to CO2, that's the amount of warming you get per doubling of CO2 without feedback, the reference sensitivity without feedback, that's the green bar on the left. All the rest is feedback response. And you can see the various estimates there of climate sensitivity happen chiefly because they're imagining a large feedback response. Now here's the error they make. Here is a typical feedback loop. Now if you're an engineer, and there are one or two here, you'll be familiar with this. On the left, R0 is the sunshine. Then you come along and you see the changes in um, temperature that might have happened. Uh, the, there's the, uh, the uh, naturally occurring greenhouse gases up to 1850, then there's the anthropogenic greenhouse gases. They're fed into the input line. That then goes to the top of the feedback loop, which is the circle there. And the feedback block inside that loop obviously acts on the whole temperature. And what climatology says, no, it doesn't. It only acts on the bit what man did. It doesn't act on the sun's warming. Well, of course, you only have to look at the diagram to see that that is complete and utter nonsense. And in fact, because we are right about this, you can simplify the diagram to the diagram B at the bottom there, where you have the reference uh, temperature coming in from the left, which includes any changes that nature and man has made to the temperature that was originally there from the sun, and you multiply that by what's called the transfer function, which is AT in the box there at a particular time T, and that spits out the equilibrium temperature, which is after feedback. So the error of definition that they make is they define feedback incorrectly. And here you'll see a few phrases from that error, which is on page 1450 of the Leiden IPCC 2013 report. And here you see they say climate feedback is a perturbation in one climate quantity causing a change in another. It's not. It's the entire temperature causing a, a change via feedback mechanisms. So we, def we then use our own proposition to go alongside theirs. We say uh, we make an argumentum ex definitione. We define the absolute reference temperature as the temperature before accounting for feedback and the equilibrium temperature as the temperature after feedback. And the ratio of those two is the transfer function. And they use uh, only the changes. They say uh, if you divide the change in equilibrium temperature by the change in um, reference temperature, then you get the, uh, the, the transfer function. You can then work out how much warming you're going to get. But what they should be using, it hasn't come out terribly well on this. Unfortunately, it's a Mac, which uh, I find rather useless. But um, A equals E over R, the absolute temperatures there. You use the whole temperature, including the temperature from the sun. Then even quite large changes in either of those two quantities, which you divide one by the other, is only going to make a small change in the transfer function. And that's how we can narrow it down and calm it all down and show that there's not going to be much global warming because there are very small uncertainties, even if you have large uncertainties in the underlying quantities, provided the underlying quantities are large enough. And so we're going to look at three temperature equilibrium. One is no greenhouse gases. One is 1850, after we put the greenhouse gases in. And the third is 2011. So we start off then with the sunshine term, which we calculate using a thing called the fundamental equation of radiative transfer. And I won't test you on this. It's rather complicated. But the answer is that if, if you had an ice ball Earth, the temperature on average on the surface would be 222 Kelvin, about 50 Kelvin below freezing. However, it wouldn't be below freezing at the equator, so feedbacks would operate, and according to a model run by NASA, the temperature would actually come up, thanks to those feedbacks, to 252 Kelvin. So the ratio of those two, which you can't see on this screen, unfortunately, is 1.1. If we do a similar calculation now for 1850, having added in the non-condensing greenhouse gases, well, the water vapor was already there, then the first thing we need to look at is, was the temperature in 1850 measured by the Hadcrew data set, the first time they measured a global temperature? Was it a... Uh, an equilibrium temperature. Was it a stable temperature? Well, look, it didn't change for 80 years, as you can see on the screen there, so it was an equilibrium temperature. So the transfer function in 1850 then works out, again, you can't see it on the screen, as 1.2. So still not very big when you think that their transfer function is around 3.5.
So then we look at the final equilibrium, which is in 2011. We take that year because that was the year to which all the numbers were cast up by the IPCC for its 2013 big assessment report. And here, what we would see if the computer hadn't screwed it up was that the, the amount of warming that we have caused since 1850 if you don't count in any feedbacks, is 0.7 Celsius. And after the feedbacks have been accounted in, it's 1 Celsius. So we add all those in to this running equation, and we find that the transfer function is still 1.2. And what that means is that if reference sensitivity to doubled CO2 is 1 Kelvin, you multiply that by 1.2, and what do you get, sir? <laughs> 1 times 1.2, anybody? Thank you very much, madam. 1.2. So, yes, quite right. You get 1.2 Kelvin, uh, 1.2 Celsius, which is not exactly 3.5, is it? In fact, it's not enough to be dangerous at all. So what have they got wrong in examining the physical world to come to their very silly exaggerations? They've, of course, made the mathematical mistake, but we'd expect that to correspond to some physical mistake that they had also made, and sure enough, they did. They predict that if you, add, if you warm the atmosphere by putting CO2 in it, then what happens is that more water vapor can be retained in the atmosphere. And this is well understood. It's called the Clausius-Clapeyron relation, for those of you who are equation nerds. There probably aren't many of you here. Um, and so you get more water vapor in the atmosphere. And sure enough, about 7% more water vapor per Kelvin of increase in the temperature of the atmosphere. And that is exactly what we see but only near the surface, where it makes no real difference. It makes a little difference only. But at the point where, where they said it would make enough difference to give you this huge water vapour feedback, which is really the sole reason why they think there's a big feedback, you'll see that about uh, nine kilometres up in the atmosphere, at the top there, it's not increasing, it's actually coming down. The green line there is a falling line. So their observation, they predicted that in the tropical mid-troposphere, about nine kilometers up, you'd get three times as much global warming as at the tropical surface. That's what all the models show. I could show you dozens of slides like this from different computer models. But there's the observation. That hot spot, which I had the honor to name it, though it doesn't actually exist, it doesn't exist. It's not there. That's what was predicted. That's what happened in real life. So there is the physical error to match the theoretical error that we demonstrated earlier. And the bottom line is on this dial. The yellow and orange and red zones, that cover the range of predictions of the IPCC and the fifth generation models of the Climate Model Intercomparison Project. And you'll see that compared with 1850, then on the black uh, dial, you would expect that by uh, the end of this century, there would be somewhere between two and a half and eight Celsius of warming. And that's why they get all in a flap. But that's because they made this mistake about the feedbacks. The green zone in there is what would they would have predicted had they used the correct equation. And the green needle there is the actual outturn. It's the amount of warming we've had up until 2011 on the blue dial. And you'll see that it matches pretty closely to what we would predict. So our, our calculations are actually consistent with observation, and rather obviously, theirs are not. Here is what you'd expect to get, the global warming from doubled CO2, the models at the top, the IPCC in the middle, their, their high, middle and low estimates in each case, and then reality at the bottom. Too, there will be some warming, but far too little to matter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in my submission, it's game over. <laughs> but let me tell you what happened next. We submitted this for peer review to the uh, Journal of uh, Climate Dynamics. And they said, um, um, we're knuckle-drugging climatologists, and we can't understand this paper, and we can't find anyone qualified to review it. Please, will you rewrite it in baby language? So... <laughs> We had to take out all the arcana of differentiation and integration, and we even had a rather spectacular uh, sum of a convergent infinite geometric series, which really frightened them. So we took all those out, uh, which established our case, in fact, very clearly. We took all that out and sent it back in baby language with pictures. And... <laughs> And the trouble is, actually, the editor of the Climate Dynamics, uh, he does have a library, but it burnt down the other day, and bo both books were destroyed, <laughs> and one of them hadn't even been coloured in. So, so um, 
So then they sent it out for review, see, and, and they sent it out to five reviewers, and they said, oh, well, we can't find anyone who can review it. So we sent them a long list. We said, these are the people who made the mistake. Send it to them. We didn't say to send it to sceptical scientists who will say, yes, Moncton's wonderful. We said, send it to people who think Moncton's an evil genius. At least they think I'm a genius. So, um, so they sent it out, and, and they only got two reviews back. Normally you get five or six for a paper of this importance. They've got two reviews back, one of which didn't review the paper at all. It reviewed one of the ancillary documents and got it wrong because it hadn't been told the ancillary document had been prepared by our National Physical Laboratory, and they know what they're doing. Um, and the other review said, I have read this paper, the conclusion is objectionable, I have not therefore read the equations that justify it. I kid you not. That is the standard of peer review in this journal, which advertises itself as providing high-quality scientific research. So we've written to the editor and said, this will not do. We want to appeal against your decision. And if you don't grant us the appeal, we're going to the police because you're participating in the largest fraud in human history. And there was a quietness for a week. And then he sent us another review. Only it wasn't a review of our paper. It was a review of an earlier paper we'd sent to another journal a year previously. And there were a few errors in that paper, which we had long since corrected. They weren't important errors. And so we're now just about, because this happened just before I came here, we're just about to write back to him and say, look, this really won't do. Yet again, you've sent us a review that isn't a review of the paper that we sent to you. Now, are you going to do your job properly, or are you going to take down off your website the suggestion to your readers who are paying good money for your journal that you're providing high-quality scientific research? If you don't either do a proper review or take that statement down, we're going to the police because you're defrauding your readers. Do you think, ladies and gentlemen, that I was justified in being that tough with him? <laughs> well, you have been a wonderful audience at this stand-up comedy show here. <laughs> and what I would like to do is to bring it back to religion in closing and just say to you this. This is the ancient blessing which has been said in the stone-built churches of England since time immemorial. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour all men. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Ghost, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.